afternoon, everyone. Thank you so, so much for joining us for the very first Wait What event. My name is Nicole Young and I serve as the Community Investments Manager for the Women's Fund of Western Mass, which our purpose is to um, serve all of the women and girls here in the four counties of Western Massachusetts. Today, um, we have people joining us from Zoom and also Facebook Live. So hello to everyone out in the virtual space. Um, before we get started, I um, just wanted to make sure that you all had a few events marked on your calendars that are coming up and some new programs. The first being our annual Career Conversations, which is a program of the Young Women's Initiative. That is scheduled for Tuesday, January 26th at 5.30 p.m. We'll be sending out more information on that. And then also I wanted to give you all a heads up about our Pathways to Power program which will be launching in the spring as the Leadership Institute for Political and Public Impact is on hold. And as a proud Lapista, I am a graduate of that program. I am extremely excited for us to launch a program that will focus specifically on addressing the parities of power throughout the entire state. Before we turn it over to our um, panel discussion, I wanna take a moment to thank our underwriter for making this event possible. Thank you so much to People's Bank for your continued support of women and girls in Western Massachusetts. So why Wait What? Wait What will be occurring on a bi-monthly basis. And the point of these types of events are, is to give us a platform to connect with all of you about relevant topics, especially given the state of the world and our society today. And today's convening will be on civic responsibilities in the time of um, national uprisings and distress. 2020 has been a roller coaster of a year. I'd like to say a trip, a one-way a one -way trip without return luggage. We've lost our luggage on the trip. Um, so we've been through a lot, including the COVID pandemic and the aftermath of that the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and everything that has happened um, thus forth, and also some very key local and national elections. I wanted to take our first wait what to talk about all of these things, especially what's going on here locally with representatives from different sectors and experiences of places where change can happen. We have representatives from a municipality. We have two state legislators um, joining us today. And we also have someone who is very active as a grassroots organizer. Actually, one of our state legislators um, started off her career as a grassroots organizer as well. So not only did I wanna convene those experiences so that we can get a feel for everything that's going on in our region, which includes Franklin County, Hampshire County, Hampton County, and the Berkshires. I wanted to hear, I wanted us to hear from every single means of community engagement. So thank you all for joining us for this ride today. So I wanna go ahead, before we get into the panel discussion, I wanted to introduce our panelists and I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order. Our first panelist is Tanisha Rana. She serves as the executive director of Arise for Social Change and hosts the podcast Unapologetic. And if you want to check out the podcast, please be sure to look for it on Holyoke Media on their social media pages. Next, we have Trisha Farley Bouvier, who is currently serving the Massachusetts House of Representatives, representing the third Berkshire district. Next up, we have Lindsay Sabadosa, state representative from the first Hampshire district, which includes Northampton, Southampton, West Hampton, Hatfield, and Montgomery. And last but not least, we have Roxanne Wade Gardner, who currently serves as the mayor of Greenfield, Massachusetts. So thank you all so much for being here today and also for lending your expertise and your experiences out in the field today. I've had a chance to follow all of you 
throughout um, your time serving in your current positions and you are making some significant impact in our communities. The first question I have is for all of our panelists. The first question I wanna open up with is, how have you been doing since the start of the pandemic? That's a pretty large question. What new initiatives have you launched since the beginning of the pandemic? And how has your work evolved? We're gonna start with um, alphabetical order. Tanisha, if you'd like to get us started. Um, hi, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being with us. Um, how am I doing since the pandemic? Um, <laughs> I think I'm okay now. I can say that, um, or as okay as we could all possibly be, or as a person could be, because while we were experiencing the pandemic, there were other things that went on that did have an impact to how I was doing and what I was experiencing at home and at work. And it was the first time for me personally where there literally wasn't a gap between what I do for work and my lived experience outside of that. Um, the you know, murdering of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, that had a tremendous impact. And we've seen these things before, but I think because it was in the context of COVID-19 with the world pretty much shut down and it was like the only thing that you had to pay attention to, that had a feeling and then also being in the role that I'm in and being responsible, you know, as the director of an organization, you know, where it's like, okay, well, they need my brain to function and do things so that they can be okay in their own lives and things because going to work every day is about their livelihood. And that was something that I had to think about. And there was a point in time where my brain did go offline. And I would say an important part of, you know, this work is having a support system at home because I, I did have that and it was like, hey, let's kickstart your brain and get it back going. Um, but, that, but that was difficult because that was a new experience. In terms of the work at Arise, this pivot that you know, COVID-19 required, you know, where we didn't have a model where we couldn't engage with people. I think that's, that's what we do, you know, organizing, marching, protesting, rallying, come into the office, have coffee, tell us what's going on in your community. You know, do we need to start a campaign around that? And suddenly, we can't do that anymore. And then making the decision to close, but still needing to be open because Arise catches everybody that's that falls through the cracks of other organizations. So if we're not in the space, then what's what's going on? And the shift included going to spaces where people were, you know, doing mutual aid and food pantry services. We opened our own food pantry because that was where one of the needs was the greatest. And then offering assistance with bill payments and things that was out of the norm because we realized that it could be the oddball bill that would make or break somebody's life. You know, for example, yes, everybody paid light bills, gas bills, what have you, but what about something like car insurance? Because if my car insurance lapses, then my registration gets suspended and then I can't drive my car to work and now I lost my job and then I can't pay my rent and now I'm homeless. Mm -hmm. So we had to think outside of the box about those things to really reach people and have an impact that was meaningful. Um, so that's been some of the experience, how am I doing in the pandemic and the evolution um, for Arise as well. Thank you so much. Um, next up, Trisha, if you would like to respond to the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciate uh, you putting this all together. And um, I, I really appreciate this question. And um, I'm going to say that as women, I think we do this better checking in with each other and, you know, how are you doing? Um, I think it's an important question to ask. Um, and so I thank you for that. And I think I'm doing pretty well. And I think I'm doing better than I was <laughs> maybe <laughs> by late spring, things were getting uh, a little, little uh, crispy around the edges, so to speak. Um, it was just so much to, um, so much information coming in so fast trying to ask you know one of the jobs of a legislator is to ask the right questions at the right time and to press back when you don't feel like you're getting uh the whole the whole answer um or you need better results um and so navigating all that and then of course we've had some very significant legislation um that we have been um working on and uh you know timely. Um, you know, we can say that last night we enacted um, in both the House and the Senate one of the most important pieces of legislation that I probably will vote for in my tenure. 
uh, my entire tenure in, in the legislature, and that is a police reform. Um, police reform bill that we did that will bring uh, much greater accountability um, to uh, to policing. Um, and again, a step in the right direction with a whole lot more work to do. Um, but I would say that um, my the steady work that I have done in the pandemic falls into two categories. One is what I've been able to do locally. And locally, I find the greatest satisfaction when I just show up to the food bank and, you know, work that myself and talk to people and understand their own experiences and carving out every Thursday morning now to be able to do that, I think um, really feeds me to be quite honest with you, but also it's a great learning experience for me. And then um, other than that, um, poor Lindsay puts up with me probably more than she'd like to, but we as a progressive caucus met every day. Um, starting in mid-March um, through the end of session at the end of July. And, and um, that work um, I found to be both really important work because we were able to, you know, to um, collectively respond um, and support each other through this, both on individual levels um, as, as individuals, as individual members, getting back to our constituents and then moving policy uh, forward. So... Um, and by the way, it's way easier to have a quick meeting via Zoom than all trying to meet up at the state house. Just <laughs> yeah. yay, commutes better. <laughs> so, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, especially for you, given how far out you are from Beacon <laughs> Hill. Yes, and congratulations on last night. That is amazing news. Next up, let's hear from Lindsay. Well, thank you. And um, I appreciate the question right off of how you're doing, because then I can just be very honest with everybody and let you all know that I'm not feeling super well today. I do not have COVID because I was able to get a test, but I I am a little under the weather. Um, so I apologize if you see me coughing off screen. Um, this has been a roller coaster. And I think that's probably a little bit of how we all feel. I see a lot of faces on this call that I know and love. So um, it's hard to remember that people are watching via Facebook and that we're not just kind of in you know, a living room chatting with one another. Um, but it has definitely been a roller coaster starting back in March where it felt like everything we, as we knew it was ending and there was going to be a new normal, which I, I think we've all sort of realized that that is true. There will be a new normal, but there are some some of those glimmers of hope. There have been glimmers of hope um, over the last few months. Um, for me, you know, I, I really, I really love my district. I really love this. I live in Northampton. I really love the city that I live in and I love the people here. And the saddest part of COVID has not, has been just not being able to be out and talking to people on that same level because, you know, Northampton is a place where you bump into people at a coffee shop or at the grocery store and you stand there and you talk. And I mean, I, I know other people said when I was elected, don't grocery shop on Saturday mornings because it will take you four hours to leave the grocery store. But I actually loved that because then I got to find out how people were doing. And so we've really had to be inventive and find new ways to connect with people and in particular connect with people who may not realize that state government can do anything to help them right now. Um, and while I am frustrated on a daily basis that we cannot do more and we, you know, I always say I wish I had magic wands. I wish I had bucketfuls of magic wands so I could just solve problems more quickly. There are lots of little ways that we can be effective. Um, and so, you know, we, we go through good periods where this summer we had outdoor dining and it felt like people were sort of getting out there and, you know, people were starting to get back to work. And now we're at a point where people are seeing their hours cut again. And for a town with a lot of small businesses, that is really, really hard. Um, so I think uh, just to be really blunt, because we're all sitting in each other's living rooms or kitchens or, or wherever, you know, we're, I feel like we're, I'm entering a little bit of a hard patch right now. We're seeing a lot of things where I wish the federal government had sent us money. I wish that I could tell people, yes, your unemployment benefits are going to get extended. Um, but we're in a moment of uncertainty. Um, but we're going to remain hopeful. I'm going to remain hopeful and uh, continue to sip tea and get better at the same time. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and I hope you feel better soon. And thank you so much for mentioning just 
the community building that we have lost in person. I want to um, shout out Northampton. That was my very first home in the area. And I met a lot of people by just sitting in a coffee shop for hours on end. And I'm sad that we have lost that. That's another reason why I wanted to pull the four of you together because of how mobile you are in your communities. The next person I would love to hear from on this question is Roxanne. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me join you. Um, and thank you for setting this up. And it sounds like they're going to continue, which is wonderful. So um, how have I been doing since the start of the pandemic? Uh, personally, I'm doing just fine and have been, for the most part, all along. I have a very strong family support system, family and friends support system. And um, they've been great because they knew it was going to be a difficult year for the first mayor, uh, for me as a first mayor, um, or being mayor for the first time, let me put it that way, third mayor of Greenfield. And, um, but I don't think they anticipated this, nor did anyone else, uh, this level of intensity. So um, shout out to my family and friends. But um, also, uh, as a city, the city of Greenfield is doing much better than it thought it would be. And I have to shout out again to the people who work for the city of Greenfield um, because they stepped up to the plate, they did their jobs um, and they did them well and they're continuing to do them well. And they're meeting, we're meeting challenges and uh, we're grateful now that I have two legislators on the on the, at my command here. Uh, uh, we're grateful for the assistance that the legislature, um, Senate and House have been giving, uh, and the governor and the Lieutenant governor have been giving communities, um, which leads me into new initiatives. When, um, I suppose I'll have a chance to talk about this later, so I won't belabor the point, but uh, that I'm a new mayor <laughs> and I uh, now have fighting a, a pandemic on my resume, which I never planned on having. So um, we were able to take advantage of some of those programs that came from the state to assist our uh, small businesses with, um, with um, micro enterprise loans. I think that was an excellent use of public money and extremely helpful to the city of Greenfield and, and the small businesses that, that are here, small and mid-sized businesses. So whether it was the shared streets money or the micro enterprise money, um, we, we feel like we really uh, were able to continue as a community and face this. And it, it actually assisted us in our revenue. So um, it, I'm happy to say, while we're not completely 100% in great shape as, as a city, we are a lot better off than we, we thought we would be. And we continue to work on housing in Greenfield. And as we enter into the uh, winter months, we are very mindful of, of the homeless people that live among us and what we might be able to do for them. Uh, so we, uh, our community and economic development department is working on those initiatives, both a warming center and expanded um, uh, overnight space, uh, working along with ServiceNet. So I feel like, Every opportunity that we can take advantage of has been uh, taken advantage of. Uh, and we continue to keep on the lookout for others. Um, as far as <laughs> evolution, well, and we're also building a new fire station and a new library here, and that has to keep going. We don't have any opportunities to, uh, to take a break on that. And that has added fuel to uh, my days, <laughs> I must admit. So um, as far as the evolution of, uh, of my work, I actually feel like some of the things that we learned during the pandemic will serve us well. We do know the extraordinary need for emergency operations in any public um, municipality, in any municipality. Um, I do want the state to understand that and um, 
and maybe learn, <laughs> plan to expand assistance uh, to municipalities, po public safety. Um, I feel like actually the um, uh, giving a nod to to social justice and the sad, very sad and unfortunate um, deaths of um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and countless others has sharpened our focus on what we need to do in this city for um, to to reach a, a, a level of social justice that we're all comfortable that we can all feel like we've accomplished. So I'm hoping we can continue to continue to have conversations around that and work on those issues. That to me feels like an evolution um, and, and a continuing movement. So our outdoor dining was a success. I'd like to see it continue. We don't have that many opportunities for that here. It's just the way cities, this particular city is laid out. So the fact that we know we can actually take some parking spaces and use them for outdoor dining and not suffer too greatly on parking revenue is because um, we make it up on the other end, more people on in town. Uh, that to me also feels like an evolution. So the evolutions are not grandiose and philosophical so much as they've been practical. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And something that you mentioned about this moment in racial and gender justice and equity, I do want to shout out Greenfield. I remember seeing the photos from one of the Black Lives Matter okay. rallies and marches, and I was like, wow, it was a very <laughs> diverse range of ages, experiences, abilities, and racial and ethnic backgrounds. That was amazing considering the size of Greenfield. It's and that true. takes me to my next, yeah. It was, it was, I was grassroots led too. It was, you know, yeah. we assisted and the, certainly the police department assisted in every way they could to keep people safe and open the streets, but um, you have to hand it to the people. <laughs> it was so great. So this takes me to my next question. And this is another question that goes to all four panelists. How have you seen racial and gender equity intersect in your work and that of your community? We're gonna go in alpha order again, starting with Tanisha. Yeah, um, the way that those two things show up at Arise, uh, when I think about the folks who uh, were coming into Arise before the pandemic and what that looks like now, it's disproportionately always been women and children, right? So who's experiencing the economic disparities, who's living in poverty, who's having those kind of experiences. And it's not to say that men don't, but that's not who we generally see. They're coming in for some other things. And um, that's not really followed through in the way that we would think, you know, in the examination of like, well, why is this happening? And how are, you know, women and kids disproportionately being affected during COVID and what that looks like and the different scenarios that, you know, a single mom has to navigate in this pandemic. So it's like, okay, are the kids going back to school? If they go back to school, I can go to work. School provides built-in childcare for all intents and purposes. If the kids are not going back to school and now I have to supervise them on Zoom, I can't go back to the office. Do I have the ability to work remotely? So that's where you see the disparities in the economics and who has access as to what do you have adequate internet can you do these things at home do you have the bandwidth you know is your own health being impacted like if you do have to go to work and so those are some of the things that we're seeing folks navigate you know um food insecurity if you're homeless and it's like that was already a problem mm -hmm. and now it's an even bigger problem and future thinking you know i've been kind of holding my breath to see what was gonna happen with the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures and what that's gonna bring. And at the end of this month, any and all protections pretty much go out of the window, but we're seeing a spike in COVID cases. So it's where are we going and who is this disproportionately affecting? I mean, it's everybody, but it's not everybody, not in the same kind of way. So that's definitely something that I've been seeing, you know, at Arise and wanting to stay out ahead of that. and be proactive and you know, letting people know what their rights are and the things that they can do as they have to go into court, if that's the case, trying to talk about the tensions of 
being a working parent, doing Zoom. I'm not an educator, but I'm responsible for my kids and their education in this kind of way and just the impacts. So it's, people are feeling it a lot. And Tanisha, this is exactly why I've wanted you on this panel, especially given something else that you've done since the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about your podcast? <laughs> well, um, the podcast is something that had been in play for a long time where Natalia Munoz at Holyoke Media had been doing some work for Arise and she would come in and, you know, we'd started this thing, Arise TV, where she would follow us around and it kind of fell off in some ways but she wanted to just record me, you know, because we I'd gone to Holyoke Media, I think the month before the pandemic and they were building a new studio. And she's like, listen, I, you could come in here. You could have guests, you could not like, just please just let me record you. And I would say no all the time because I was like, what if I run out of things to talk about as if, right? In this uh, climate that we're in. And finally, I just said, yes. And it was uh, for me, uh, probably more of a personal development thing where it's like, start saying yes to these things that come your way and not shrinking into the background. And we would just record, like she would talk and it eventually got to a place where she's like, okay, as soon as we get on the Zoom, I'm gonna hit record because anything could happen. And that's really what it was. Um, when we do sit down together, she'll ask me my thoughts on something. She's recording and I just go. And it was how to talk about these things that we're experiencing and connecting the dots in the most simplistic terms because these situations don't exist in a vacuum, right? The civil unrest that we were seeing, the uprising of white supremacy, and even being able to say these things out loud, unapologetically, like we need to talk about this. If you can't name the thing, how are you ever going to change it? Like, how, how are you going to problem solve around it if you won't even say what it is or want to continuously deny its existence? And it is the underlayment of all of these social problems. Like I've been saying, white supremacy is the Windows 10. And all of our programs, <laughs> like in your computer, they run through the Windows 10, whatever that happens to be. So if we're talking about housing and economic justice, homelessness, environmental justice, um, criminal justice or the criminal state, the, the incarceration system, they're all running through this program, you know, in a white supremacist framework and actually being able to talk about what that looks like and what it means and what are the things that we can do. Because it's not about just saying, hey, this really sucks and there's no hope. It's this is what we can do. You know, we have these choices and coming together, but again, can we name the thing? So unapologetic is I guess my, my ramblings and musings about things and I want people to think and come away with something different. My goal is to not change anybody's mind, but certainly to plant a seed that's like, oh, I didn't think about it like that. Because to me, that's the most powerful thing. And that's where someone's long-term change will come from because they're getting to that place on their own. You can't drag somebody to that place, right? They've got to connect those dots in ways that are meaningful. So that's kind of what happened with the podcast and it, it wasn't supposed to be connected to a rise but I had had some feedback so I was like okay so say that I'm the ED of a rise and I'm doing this podcast because a lot of the things I'm talking about they are directly connected to this work at a rise you know how how do these things exist because of this underlayment so let's talk about them unapologetically and we can have these conversations Thank you. And I love and thank you for tagging me on Facebook whenever <laughs> an episode goes up so I can know when to look out for it. <laughs> and Trisha, would you like to take on the question next? I'm um, sure. So first I'm going to say, Tanisha, I'm really enjoying listening to you today and certainly will look for that podcast. And if it took you at what we say all the time in women in politics, is it usually takes a woman seven times to be asked before that she'll <laughs> run for office. So it sounds like you had to be asked seven times to, um, to do a podcast, but I'm going to say to you, I sure do hope you run for office. And so that's at least <laughs> once that you've been asked. <laughs> so six more and then you'll be on the ballot, right? Okay. So the question is about um, race and gender and how this, you know, what's happening um, this year with that given the pandemic. And 
Um, people have talked about um, COVID being this great big spotlight, right? And it uh, it is really showing in 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 great relief all the inequities that we already have, and and um, it it couldn't be more true, right? So um, it is people, quote unquote, with underlying conditions that you know, are impacted, their health is impacted more by COVID. They're, they're more likely to get COVID. Well, why did they have the underlying conditions, right? It was because of the inequities that we have, right? So that's the health part. Um, certainly the social justice um, issues and the police reform, I, I mentioned that before, there was a lot of great work that done there. And the, and the part that I'm the proudest with, um, with that work is that it was led by the Black and Latino Caucus. And we understood, we as a collective understood really quickly that it needed to be led by the Black and Latino Caucus. And um, through our colleague, um, Chairman Carlos Gonzalez from Springfield, um, he did you know, an outstanding job uh, doing what was very, very difficult work. And I wanna just focus for one minute on the word difficult. And I think we can um, exemplify how difficult it was because even after all this work with this being one of the most important um, bills that the speaker has worked on, 34 Democrats voted against police reform. 34 mm -hmm. Democrats did. This is really, really hard work. And it's complicated. You can't just say, okay, everybody voted against it, are bad people or anything like that. It's really complicated work. But I'm going to really focus on women <laughs> and how women have really been um, disproportionately impacted by this. The data is clearly out. Women are leaving the workforce in droves, in droves. This will have a long lasting impact on our overall economy and certainly on households and what it means to the individual woman but also we know right the career of a woman means is is uh is, impacts the whole family right so you know why is that um well let's look at predominantly women um jobs okay so and i'm just going to focus on two <laughs> two <laughs> One, taking care of the elderly, direct care, and the other direct care of taking care of children. Those are you know, traditionally women jobs and traditionally for, for the longest time, they were completely unpaid jobs, right? We didn't pay women to take care of their families, right? You were just expected to do that and completely unpaid. So now, um, you know, Things have, you know, evolved a bit, and now we, you know, we have people in care, whether it's skilled nursing care or um, in uh, who are being taken care of at home, um, and we, you know, we hire mostly women to do that, and we completely and totally underpay them, and then we're surprised that we don't have enough workforce. Right? We're surprised by that. We're worried about that. Why is it? Couldn't this just be a career ladder and eventually they'll be able to um, earn more? That's what we say, right? Right? We just say, well, I know we're going to underpay them at the beginning, but it gives them a chance to, to earn more. Why aren't we paying them to begin with to do some of the most important work we have to take care of our cherished seniors? Like, well, what is it in our mindset that we don't do that and it has to change? And what has it led to? In Massachusetts, we have one of the worst rates of nursing home deaths anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of our deaths from COVID mm -hmm. are in nursing homes. Two thirds, that is an abomination. Now we'll go to early ed and childcare. Again, we do not pay mostly women who are doing this work, right? It's, um, and we've worked so hard to raise their uh, standard of education, right? There's all sorts of investments. Let's get them um, to, to raise the standard, right? And I watch them every year, they cross the stage at MCLA, right? It's a really exciting time for them. And the next Monday morning, they go back to work earning 1350 an hour right? Doesn't help with their pay. Not really. And we don't have enough staff. People cannot get their kids into daycare. 
which means the, just as Tanisha was saying before, now mom is staying home to take care um, of their young children, having to take care of children, you know, balancing the whole schoolwork thing. It is, and it, again, it's falling on women disproportionately. And we have to keep the drumbeat going that we have to address the issues of paying people who are taking care of our seniors and paying people who are taking care of our children. They deserve to earn, I mean, living wage. Like they shouldn't have to work three jobs for asking them to do this. So that's my soapbox. And um, I just can't ever stop talking about that. Thanks, Nicole. Trisha, thank you so much, especially for calling out a community that I feel like gets neglected so much, but they've given us so much. And that is those of our elderly population. Because I know my grandmother, my grandmother is on both sides of my family. When I was younger, babysat me for free a lot of the times when both of my parents were working two and three jobs. And so now I feel like we are doing a disservice to those who have given to us in a lot of ways. And also one thing that I want to note, this may be anecdotal, it might be written somewhere, but I think a lot of the households that are that you, um, of the of the households that you serve, many of you, the head of the household is a grandparent, and we do a horrible job. We do a horrible job supporting that particular population. So, Trisha, thank you for um, putting a spotlight on that, Lindsay. You're up next um, with the question. That's not a small question, right? I started to take notes early on to, to think of different things that I could bring up here in, in the ways, and I think Trisha said it well, how COVID has really put a spotlight on what we knew were cracks in our system. Um, and the first thing that came to mind, well, actually the very first thing that came to mind was a local business owner, just to emphasize this point of women being forced out of the workforce. She said she, she'd closed her store, she's reopened it. She previously had 11 employees. Um, six of them were women, none of the women have returned. And none of the women have returned because they have kids at home and they are the caregivers and they can't come back to work. And um, I love this business owner. She reaches out a lot with, with stories of what's really happening on the ground. And that to me is really poignant that six of your employees, all of the women, not a single one has been able to come back to work. Um, the other thing I want to bring up are, is the, the showers and the shelters when we're talking about our homeless population, because I think a lot of times when we talk about that population, we, we forget um, that there are families and that there are women. And so we are seeing in this conversation about how do we make sure people are sheltered over the winter, that particularly women are not wanting to go into shelters and they're not wanting to go into shelters because they don't feel safe there. Um, and we have not at any point during this pandemic answered the shower question. I had one woman um, that I spoke to who said, you know, women menstruate which you know, most of us know, um, but we, so that means we'd like to shower. We want to be able to be clean and there is no way for us to do this in, that, in this city. You know, a shower once a week is not gonna cut it. And it's again, it's just highlighting, highlighting inequities and things that I think most of us don't think about on a daily basis. Um, but now I'm gonna go in a totally different direction because I told you I'm at a point where, where things, um, where I'm, I'm feeling like we're going downhill a little bit and uh, or at least my my mood is and last night I opened my email and I had um legal documents from an attorney who is currently um in the middle of a lawsuit with the department of corrections in Massachusetts around home confinement and they are suing the department of corrections because I think or at least I hope everybody here knows that there have been some very massive outbreaks in our prisons and I'm, it's in the paper today about the Hamden County Jail. And we've long been asking, and I've been asking since March now um, for efforts to release people out of, these, out of these congregate living situations. So we're not asking for blanket releases. We're saying, if, if this is safe, figure out a way to do this. The document I read last night shows that the state of Massachusetts has, um, rather than even thinking about releasing people, has deemed correctional officers uh, first responders, 
which means that even if they have come in contact with someone who has COVID, they do not need to quarantine, which means that we have for months been sending correctional officers to work, knowing that they have had direct contact with people who have COVID. We have not been testing and we have not been tracing. So this is where I come into this call a little bit on edge today because those things really, they fire you up in, um, in very powerful ways because we know that that shouldn't be happening, right? We know we want contact tracing in our communities. We want testing. We know that these things have to happen. We're fighting every day for more testing in Western Massachusetts because we don't have any in Hampshire and Franklin counties. And Trisha, I don't think you have a, a spread, stop the spread site in Berkshire County either. I mean, that's how inequitable this is. And that's just for people who are not incarcerated. So if you think that people are in a congregate living situation and people are allowed to come in and out of that building with known con COVID contacts, that's, I think, criminal, honestly. I think criminal. And I think we've seen that same pattern play out. We saw that pattern play out at the Holyoke Soldiers Home, where far too many of our veterans died for absolutely no good reason. Trisha said it eloquently that this is happening in our nursing homes. This is us not valuing all lives. And I had someone laugh at me because they said, oh, are you saying all lives matter? <laughs> and I was like, that's what the word black lives matter mean. It means that everybody's life actually matters and we should be valuing those. And this pandemic has really shown me that our state does not. Wow, Lindsay, thank you so much for that story. And I'm still like, I don't know if people saw my facial reaction <laughs> when you mentioned the fact that correction officers have been labeled first responders, but they're not been getting tested. I just don't like that we're putting so many people at risk in that way. Lastly, I would like to address this question, and this has been such an amazing conversation, and I wish there was a way we could share the um, chat that's going on on Facebook Live because there's some amazing conversations happening. Um, Roxanne, um, if you would like to chime in on this topic. Well, I feel like Tanisha and Lindsay and Tricia have, um, have framed it very well and I share all of their thoughts. Um, I'm uh, probably the oldest person on this call. So I certainly have a lifetime of experience of being a woman who has had to fight for her gender equity every step of the way. And I have, um, so I appreciate always. And I just, again, I, I guess I wanna say that here in City Hall, every significant department in the city of Greenfield that is in City Hall, with the exception of the tech department is run by women. So um, happy to say that uh, out loud for everyone. Um, you know, our DPW and our police and fire are, are excellent, excellent um, men who run, who run an excellent department. But in City Hall, um, this is who's here. <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud of that. It, it was like three days into my um, my being and after being inaugurated in last January that I realized that and I thought, wow, that's something I never realized. Um, so that helped, that helped a lot. And um, our school committee as well and our, our school system as well. So um, that's not to say that we don't have a lot of work to do in our community, both on racial and gender equity. I will say we did have a pay equity study in the city of Greenfield. And um, we fared a lot better than I thought. We had two positions um, out of several hundred um, that needed to be brought up to speed as opposed to what I was thinking, which was going to be a lot more. So I was, I was happy about that. But uh, Greenfield, the city of Greenfield still has a lot of work to do. When I sat down with my chief of staff, um, Danielle Letourneau, at the very beginning, like within the first or second week, long before COVID, well, not really that much longer, like a month before COVID um, hit the city, I said, we have to do more to get more women and more uh, people of color um, and as, as members of our workforce here. Uh, it's difficult to do in Franklin County because we are 90 some odd percent um, uh, white. 
Um, but we set out to do that. We, um, you know, budgets being what they are and COVID being what it was, it's been a little bit truncated, but I'm ready to get back to work on that. And uh, we're pursuing um, some ways in which to reach out to um, people of color and more women and encourage them to both apply for positions in the city of Greenfield, as well as for many of our boards and commissions. So it continues to be a goal. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And I didn't realize so many women ran departments in Greenfield. And I think that <laughs> emphasizes the importance of why women need to lead. And this takes me into our very first, um, I did some targeted questions to our panelists. The first one is to Tanisha. And Tanisha is someone, I, I hope you have some really good sneakers with some really good insoles because I see you <laughs> marching everywhere, speaking on the steps of Springfield City Hall. You are everywhere and you have taken on so many different issues. So what I'd like to do, because I would love to have an opportunity for those who are joining us today to do Q&A, um, if we can do these as rapid fire question responses, that would be awesome. So okay. Tanisha, the question to you is, what specific social movements have emerged in your own backyard? What role have you played and how have you seen your own work evolve during this time? Okay, I started to take notes so I could just go. So um, obviously during this time, COVID, the homelessness uh, issue, the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, um, health equity as born out of the experience of COVID, but also because mold is an issue in the state of Massachusetts and it's not even part of the sanitary code. And that also uh, disparately affects black and brown communities. Um, the police brutality issue, the Department of Justice reports that came out about the Springfield Police Department um, and all those kind of things, the incarceration issues that Lindsay talked about with COVID-19. And for me, it was like somebody that got a three minute sentence for something stupid that could be a death sentence with COVID and the pushback with the uh, corrections uh, department. Um, I started doing consulting around racial justice and equity issues. It's dialogues across difference. And that's why I'm always talking about, we can have these hard conversations about race and equity. We need to be doing this work. Um, I became a member of the NAACP specifically so that I could be part of the women in the NAACP and the census work that they were doing because at the time the census was still open and then connecting the dots through my podcast about the importance of the census and the historical value. Uh, which still blows my mind that, you know, my ancestors were better represented, you know, as enslaved people than we are today with the freedom to self-report. Because again, the founding fathers, they understood this value of bodies. So this being a numbers game. And then of course, with the election and voter suppression that we could all see and what that looks like. So in getting the word out about voting, um, and doing your census and all those kind of things. Um, of course, all things Black Lives Matter, um, biomass, which is still an issue in Springfield. I call it biomass 3.0 because literally this is the third time. Um, it's the thing that won't die. Um, Arise was involved in the, in the beginnings of this to shut down you know, any talk about having this biomass plant built in Springfield, which is an, a designated environmental justice community. Right, more than half the people have asthma or respiratory issues. So it's like you want to put a uh, wood pellet burning plant in this place that has a failing air quality grade from the American Lung Association. Why do you want to do this? This, by definition, is environmental racism because who does this disproportionately affect? Black and brown people. Now, there was a fire at Bondi Island a couple weeks okay. ago and it blanketed the surrounding communities with smoke. That was just a fire. What do you think biomass is going to do when the smoke doesn't know to stay in the smoking section? So if you live in Agawam, Longmeadow, East Longmeadow, Chicopee, the surrounding areas, you might want to care because you also have to breathe the air that like the stuff that they're going to burn. So that's something to be mindful. And yes, I've tried to be in lots of spaces to talk about these issues and some different spaces to shed light in other communities and places so that you can know what's going on. And I just, I don't know, I changed my shoes. <laughs> so it's <laughs> <laughs> it's all important. Um, I try to say yes more than I say no. And then also being mindful of my own bandwidth, because again, 
the gap between the work that I do versus this life and my experience has become really small. Thank you. And again, <laughs> this is exactly why you need to run for office, Tanisha. I'll be asking you a couple more times. So yes, this is the, Trisha says this is the second time. Yeah. The next, <laughs> yes. The next question in this rapid fire goes to Roxanne. Okay. You are, yes. I was gonna say, I'll try to do the speed dating version myself. Um, <laughs> but, uh, by the way, to Tanisha, you might want to check out this Greenfield zoning bylaw because we dealt with the biomass issue a long time ago and we have a pretty good zoning bylaw that the city of Springfield, correct? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, city um, council closed the loopholes. So now they're trying it in Boston to see, uh -huh. can, you know. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, you, you might want to uh, take on one more pair of shoes and see if you can't uh, get some zoning that around the biomass issue to protect you going forward. Um, so, um, let me take a look here. Oh yes, I was <laughs> inaugurated on January 2nd. Uh, on February 6th, we had our very first meeting with our emergency operations committee on this potential deadly virus that seems to be moving. Um, in that case, uh, we were built in uh, the belief that it was coming out of China, out of Wuhan, and what are we gonna do about it? And we haven't stopped meeting um, since. We have a, a weekly meeting on, on where we are at with COVID and how we're handling it. Um, they're not as lengthy and they're not as intense. We've learned a lot, but, um, but that was a trial, a, certainly a trial by fire. I had a lot of other plans on my plate for the, for the city of Greenfield. We have a wonderful emerging creative economy here. We have um, uh, entertainment venues um, that are are, are become or were becoming nationally known. And I wanted to focus on that. Well, as you can tell, that has been extremely difficult because we cannot gather in public places in any great number. And um, the organizations that do um, provide uh, outlets and provide cultural aspects have been doing a great job, but it's, it's limited. So um, I'm anxious for the vaccine. I'm anxious for everybody to get back to, um, I don't like to use the term new normal, um, but I know um, um, that uh, we will be doing things differently, slightly differently going forward, no matter what, uh, for quite some time. Um, I, I am feeling very confident uh, and somewhat optimistic uh, about the nation. I feel like it's interesting. We've been on this call for an hour and um, we've uh, focused appropriately on our own community, but I feel like we have um, really been handed um, uh, a wonderful gift um, that we can now get out from under the last four years and begin to move forward. It is gonna take a long time for this country to, um, to heal um, from what we've been through, but I feel like um, the election told us that we were ready to do that hard work and hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm strangely, um, uh, optimistic about uh, the city of Greenfield moving forward um, and making great progress. I just lost a year, that's all. I guess it just means I'll have to run again. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think that's what the pandemic did. It was like, Roxanne, you have a moment to shine and guess what we're gonna, you have to continue the torch. You need that eight years to really solidify your work. The next question goes to Lindsay, and this is someone who started grassroots organizing as a child with, mar with organizing marches and things like that. So being in the same room with people is very key to your work. 
So thinking about the virtual sphere um, and how it has forced us to take on new ways to stay connected. And, I, and I'm asking this question because you were all over social media when it came to Monty's March. It was so great mm -hmm. to see you on social media in Monty's March. And for people who don't know, Monty's March um, literally walks from Springfield to Greenfield in an effort to raise money to address food insecurity and donate that money back to the Food Bank of Western Mass. So with that regard, because you're, you're all over social media and you've made a point to still be seen in the community, can you talk about how you've shifted your outreach efforts given that most of them are now virtual and what are the possibilities in virtual engagement and what have been some of those limitations? So, so that's interesting because I, I uh, you did give us the questions ahead of time. So I read this one and I was going to take it in a different direction because I do see a lot of limitations with virtual communication. Like I, you get the feedback, right, of who actually opens up and reads your newsletter, who is, is looking at your social media. Facebook is full of metrics. So you can kind of tell who that group is. The same thing with Twitter and Instagram. And um, for me, I feel like I can, I, you know, I only know I'm if I'm moving in the right direction, if I can actually talk to people. So you're right, being out in the community is super important to do that. And then just trying to figure out ways um, to do that and do it safely. So I think, um, you know, earlier someone had mentioned like getting out and volunteering and that's actually been really useful. So I've, you know, gone out a few times with Grow Food Northampton where we're handing out food at, at Hampshire Heights. So at some of the apartment complexes in Northampton, people are coming, you're getting to talk to them a little bit. I have found, you know, just having a conversation with one person, because people are really good at talking to each other. So even if I'm not having a conversation with 100 people, if I talk to one person about like, oh, hey, did you know that um, you have a problem with the RMV, I can help with that, that all of a sudden, I will get 50 calls <laughs> from everybody there who has that same issue. So I, it's always about tentacles, like each each interaction maybe is only with a some very small group of people. And we need it to be that, that way right now, just so that we can stay safe. But if you can get those tentacles out in the community, the better. You know, I, I write a monthly column in the newspaper, it definitely gets some more people coming through the door. Um, but you know, it's, it's really hard, because I just I always I know that there are people out there who have not necessarily made the connection that they need to at the right time. And I'm, I'm not putting that on them. It's the way our world works. But, um, you know, when I have someone who will call me who will call and say, I've been waiting for unemployment for nine months, they should never be waiting for unemployment for nine months. That's that's wrong. And so then we figure out new ways to, to make that connection moving forward. For me, it's also reaching out to a lot of groups um, that are sending out newsletters to and just making sure that they know how to contact me, how what we're working on, that I want people's feedback. Um, and one of the things that I'm working on now is a mailer for the district um, and just sending that out so that people know how to get in touch. But even there, you know, there are 45 thousand people who live in this, there are 40, 43 um, thousand people who live in my district. And I know that the mailer won't get to all of them, that all of the right people won't see it. Um, and so it, it remains a challenge, but I think, you know, at least being on social media is one way, but it's definitely not the only way. And particularly with unemployment, it has I've learned that there are a lot of people in our community who do not have cell phones and do not have computers. And I did not realize how great that number was until there was something that people needed to do that we have made virtually only online. So um, I don't know that I have like the best answer to this question. I wish that I could just be out on the streets every day talking to folks. And um, before COVID, I did office hours on the bus, which was the best way to talk to people just as they were going about their day. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting getting back to that a little bit. Perfect, thank you. And our last rapid fire question goes to Tricia, who has been serving in the Massachusetts House of Representatives since 2011. I recently read an article in Mass Live that mentioned 
that there are 19 new senators and representatives joining the Massachusetts state legislation coming up, including state representative elect Patricia Duffy of Holyoke, state senator elect Adam Gomez, and representative elect Orlando Ramos. And those two have served on the Springfield City Council. And with Patricia, she worked for um, outgoing representative Vega. It is a very diverse slate representing various types of experiences, backgrounds, and pathways. The question is, are we ready? And what has prepared us for this moment? So that's a great question. And it's, um, you know, you just told a story that is um, a terrific story. When every new class comes in, um, we're excited. Um, and we certainly are ready. Um, I, you know, when you hang out with me, you know that I talk about the Progressive Caucus a lot. So I think something that we do particularly well in the Progressive Caucus is um, welcome new members. And I think um, we made a decision um, six, eight years ago that um, our currency in the Progressive Caucus is information. That is the value that we bring to the individual members. And believe me, when you become a legislator, getting information <laughs> is really, really hard. Um, and, um, and then building capacity for the individual office. So every, every state rep coming in is afforded one staff member. And um, it's just such a challenge to get through the amount of work that you have to get through. Um, you know, for example, we have a, we, we address a lot of constituent needs, right? So that's individual constituent cases for, for, for each one of those. Um, and some are very complex. And then you have to read about, you know, you have to learn about legislation that's coming in and you have your committee work that you're doing and you're trying to communicate with your constituents via, via social media. And then, you know, a pandemic, you know, hits and we have to, um, you know, deal with all that came that way. So we take those resources of one staff per office and we put them together into this staff working group and that staff, which are, they're unbelievably fabulous, then gets that information back out to us. And so we get briefings on bills. We track the budget in much closer detail than we would be able to. We're able to play defense on bills that can be bad for our constituents, we think is bad policy. And so we've been able to build the capacity of the Progressive Caucus um, ex exactly because of that. And we look forward to welcoming uh, new members. We're particularly excited, um, you know, Pat Duffy, you know, already is a colleague of ours because she's worked so closely with us as a staff member of the Progressive Caucus, really a leader within that, within that uh, staff uh, group. So talk about being up to speed, right? <laughs> um, and then um, I always particularly enjoy working with people who have worked at the municipal level uh, coming through. I happened to be a, a city councilor myself years ago. So, um, so are we ready? We are. Um, and we do our best work when we have diversity of experiences. It's bringing that expertise together and being able to rely on each other that makes us stronger within the Progressive Caucus. And, and I would say that um, I've been so excited over the last few years to see the level of expertise that are coming into the legislature. It is, it's been remarkable. Thank you so much. And then I have one last question for our panelists before we open it up to question and answer to all of our attendees. We've had a very eventful year, not only due to COVID, climate change, everything around Black Lives Matter, we've had a lot of people, pivotal people pass on, both locally and also um, nationally, very key people who have championed for rights that are um, significant to the work that we do. And if people can answer this question in rapid fire style, that would be awesome. So we can give more time for Q&A. What do you consider the biggest implications for those you serve as we begin a new season, both locally with new state legislators and the impact of COVID and nationally with new US legislation? Um, let's start with Roxanne first. Oh dear. 
<laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, but I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Into the alphabet. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, I was just trying to frame my answer to that. It's not that you caught me off guard. It's just picking one, I guess. Um, I, I think I've said, I it, it, it boils down to onward. People know me, that's my phrase. Keep on keeping on. We are um, stronger, really, really stronger as a, as a community when we work together as a community. And I think despite some of our um, statistics in the state of Massachusetts, when I think about other states um, and where they're at with regard to fighting the pandemic, um, we, are, we are certainly um, in better shape than most in, in many ways. We, we certainly have other areas and the legislators know more about that than I do um, that we need to work in. But um, I think the biggest implications are not to lose hope, not to lose heart. There is, I feel like um, some light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine. So let's keep, uh, let's keep working together um, to um, get back to um, a place where we can have some successes and not have to stress so much about uh, the day-to-day -day. and we can begin to work on those issues that we've all called out here, racial um, and gender equity, um, economic justice, housing. Those are the things that we need to be focusing on. Well, cool. thank you so much, Roxanne. And we're, I want to mention we're going in reverse alpha order. Next up is Lindsay. <laughs> turned off my video and managed to unmute myself there we go um so i i think that you know i'm, I'm excited to work with a lot of the new colleagues that will be coming in but i i think in terms of the state level that i see us as kind of being a steady force for the next two years and what i i think is going to have the most effect really is what happens on the federal level and i say this all the time um, because it is is so important what what funding comes through from the federal government will impact our ability to you know whether we extend unemployment whether we have money going to higher education um what we're able to do just as a state what our budget is going to look like those federal dollars are so critical so I, you talked about big events i mean i think this upcoming race in georgia is going to be a big 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 event um and i don't know what's going to happen um i am going Going to remain cautiously optimistic. Um, but seeing the federal government take some big, bold steps and actually pass another relief bill, I mean, getting getting another round of, of PPP out to small businesses would be incredible. Um, getting money into our hospitals, making having a coordinated response for um, protective equipment would be incredible. So I, I'm, I'm looking for more guidance from the federal level coming. I think that we're going to get it, but that race in Georgia is is critical. So if you are so inclined, write those postcards. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay. Trisha, you're up next. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. And um, I signed up for my 200 postcards today. Um, let's get those out. At least we have a little more time than the last round, right? We have all three weeks. <laughs> the three days. Anyway, um, I guess I look at this as um, this is might be more aspirational, but what I am hoping is that with every bill that we pass at the state level, um, we have um, you know, a diversity, equity, inclusion um, note on it. <laughs> like we have a fiscal note, like we have to have a fiscal note that's required, but we should be looking at every, um, every policy that we pass and, um, and have it be through that lens. And um, we, we passed a terrific bill this year. Well, it's not quite to the governor's desk yet. On um, the um, 2050 roadmap bill, we, we refer to it as and um, within that, we do have an environmental justice um, portion of that, which is incredibly important. And it says every, um, you know, every project has to be looked at through that environmental justice uh, viewpoint. And I, I'm hoping that we can, as a regular course of business, 
be looking at any policy we pass, any, whether it's budgetary, legislative, um, we do it um, through that lens. Thank you so much. And last up is Tanisha. Oh my gosh. Um, so some of the biggest implications that I could think of, and maybe they are not so optimistic, is that we will return to normal. Like none of this happened. We didn't see any of these things and they'll just kind of mm. not necessarily get brushed under the rug, but just kind of disappear into, I guess, the ether as we continue on about this business as usual. Um, and I don't want us to lose sight of the depth of the disparity that this pandemic has has shown us. I mean, we knew that the cracks were there, but it's like, did you know it was like this gaping abyss? And now that you do, what are we going to do about it? And a lot of these things, you know, that I see in the community that I'm a part of and that I work with, they're economic issues on so many levels. And I can appreciate, you know, the policy examination, you know, about is this environmentally sound? Is it just? But can we have that, that anti-racist lens on a lot of these things and actually dismantle the systems and institutions that have been in place since the establishment of this country so that we can get away from where we are? Because we also have to talk about that. Like, how are we going to have healing if we cannot address the roots of the inequality that brought us this pain, right? So I, those are some of the implications that I see. And just let's not fall back into business as usual. And even if there is a vaccine, I have to consider what that looks like and who wants to take this vaccine, because there are communities that have been used as guinea pigs with or without their consent to see if something like this works. So we have to also, you know, bring light to the mistrust in our government that has existed for some and is now existing for another group of people. And like just going forward, can we design at the margins? Because if it's accessible for someone who has the greatest number of barriers, then it will be accessible for everybody else. So can we start coming at this from that place? Like, can the person who has the most difficulty get this? And if they can, well, everybody else can, right? So let's start looking at equity. Can people get what they need? And if they cannot, we must do everything that we can to make it so, so that this country lives up to its promise of everything that it could be for all of its citizens, right? Um, everybody, right? our immigration policies, our criminal justice, like all of it. Let's tear down the systems that oppress the majority of the people in this country. And let's tell the truth about it. Perfect. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for their insight, clarity, just everything. And again, this is the reason why I wanted to bring all four of you together because I knew I could forecast the conversation was going to go in this direction. So we would like to open up for the last 11 minutes for our conversation for Q&A from our attendees. For those who feel compelled and moved, if you would like to unmute yourself to um, pose questions to our panelists, that would be awesome. Who would like to start us off? Can I hit the question in the chat? Yes. Um, I saw it when it popped up and it was about the unintended conse consequences of using military um, language to categorize labor that's more valued. And when we first started to hear this essential worker um, dialogue, my question was, are we talking essential or sacrificial? Because who are we putting into these spaces and places? And then when people say, oh, well, we're all in this together, we're not all having the same experience. Right, because your social positioning, your eco social economic status could determine how close you had to get to the danger of the situation. Are you able to work remotely? Do you have to go into work? I mean, yes, doctors and nurses deserve the biggest you know, debt of gratitude because they're literally like saving lives, putting their own lives in danger. But so was the gas station worker. So was the truck driver. So was the person at Walmart and Target. Like when we were going out hoarding toilet paper, those people were also doing something essential or was it sacrificial? Because if we had a different administration and leadership and we could have all been at home safe, but then home, what if you didn't have a home to be in? Like, it just, this would have played out a heck of a lot different. So I think using that language 
it does create some unintended consequences, right? When we talk about somebody that's on the front lines, I'm thinking the infantry person with the gun, but then even in our militarized, you know, country, who's on the front lines and what does their life value look like as opposed to the five-star general that's in the tent, you know, looking at things happening on the TV screen saying, where do the infantry people go? So we do have to address all of the connotations with our language and what it means in our communities because who is being sacrificed for the greater good or, or that that's our framework, that there has to be someone sacrificing for this greater good in this way. So those are my thoughts on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have a question um, that they would like to unmute themselves for to post our panelists? I can ask my question. Perfect. Hi, Emily. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> Great well, to see you. It's good to see you. Um, so I have a question. I put it in the chat, but one of the things I've been thinking a lot about, and I don't think I'm alone, is in Western Massachusetts as a region, it's been very siloed. You know, Franklin County, Hamden County, Hampshire County, even Northampton, Amherst, cross the river, you're dead to me. Like it's a very, um, what's the word I'm looking, compartmentalized and segregated area. And I really think we're looking, looking forward, we're gonna see a dramatic shift in our economy, um, both in terms of who the major employers are as remote work happens, where are those offices? Um, as Tanisha was mentioning, please run for office. Um, if there's a biomass in Springfield, that's not just gonna, it's not like it's going to just affect Springfield. Like there's not a bubble over Springfield that's gonna contain the um, environmental impacts and health impacts from something like that. Um, so I'm just wondering what needs to happen to break that down finally so that we can start seeing it as our economy and our region and our public health issues and our education issues because I, I feel like there's this influx of talent and ability and need that could all be supporting each other in different ways and I'm just curious what you all think about how we can start to address that issue. So I'll start out, I'll jump into this and, and say that um, it's, it's really like the Women's Fund of Western Mass has, has really been very intentional about always including um, uh, each county, like they're very intentional about that. Um, and the work never ends and the need for intentionality never ends. And I'll give you an example when it comes to Lippy. Um, you know, getting applicants from Berkshire County has always been kind of, you need, it takes a lot of extra work, right? Because I'm not so much connected. Um, you have to drive further away to, to attend the classes, you know, things like that. Um, and so it's, it is gonna take a lot of intentional work and because personnel changes all the time, it's like you always have to keep redoing that. Now, and now I'm gonna get a little bit defensive um, <laughs> to say, talk about Berkshire County and say that often at the state level, um, they say, oh, we're giving this to Western Mass. I'll give you an example. We sent um, you know, 100,000 100, pieces of PPE to Western Mass, okay? Um, this is when Berkshire County had the, the community spread. We had first community spread. We had our first inpatient. We had our first, the first nursing home in the state. And we really, really needed it in Berkshire County. It never got past Bay State Springfield. It all got stuck there. And then we were supposed to go beg them for our PPE. And so I can, I always refer to I-91 as a glue, uh, glue trap. And you know, the funding comes and gets stuck, stuck on I-91 and we can't seem to get it in the Berkshires. So that's being me, me being a little bit fresh. I know that I'm being a little bit fresh there, but um, like if we're going to really work together as, um, as a community, then we really have to have value um, to all, all the counties. And like, I, I look at Roxanne and I think to myself, you know, what's it like to be in Franklin County where <laughs> it's even harder. I, that's how I think of it. It's even harder in, in, in Franklin County. So um, uh, I, sometimes I feel like um, Springfield uses the population of the surrounding counties to be able to get, you know, their share of the funding, but then it doesn't get distributed um, uh, uh, across all four counties. 
things. So we I just can, have to keep working on that. <laughs> I can I can add a little bit to that. Thank you for uh, Tricia. Um, I, I, I'll make two points. Um, in Franklin County, we have the Re Franklin Regional Council of Governments. So that is a fantastic organization led by a wonderful group of people. And, um, and certainly at the top, um, uh, Linda Dunleavy, but um, that is how we work together. That is how we break down silos. And uh, I feel like I'm always reminding uh, people. I, I also serve on the Western Mass Economic Development Committee's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, subcommittee. We meet um, monthly, and we've been talking about these very issues a lot. And I'm on there, thanks to Eve Solomon Fernandes, who is the other, uh, the president of Greenfield Community College. And and the other person from Franklin County. And we find that we are, even we were looking at the census and what, um, where uh, economic uh, businesses are distributed among uh, people of color versus, the, versus um, um, uh, whites in uh, Western Massachusetts, it was stark that Franklin County doesn't even make the census numbers because we don't have enough people of color in their mind, that's the federal government's mind. Um, and you know, that affects everything. So <laughs> I am constantly um, raising my hand and saying, well, in Western Massachusetts, you're not talking about a thing, you're talking about a lot of things. You're talking about very diverse communities with very di diverse economies. And you can't just um, assume that we are a monolith, we have by default in our legislature had to speak as, as if we were one, because otherwise, how else are we going to get heard? So uh, the Western Mass delegation does a great job of that, but um, we need to, um, we need to constantly keep reminding each other that we are a community. And if we need to reach out and help one another, as we do here in, in Franklin County, uh, through the FERCOG, then um, then however we get to that is going to be is going to be important. Um, I, I don't have an answer uh, to your question, Emily, per se. Just to say that um, that you know it's not lost on on the, those of us in Franklin County uh, at all. And I I I share <laughs> Trisha's Berkshire County um, uh, concerns as well. Thank you so much. And actually, this is the reason why I chose and applied to this position with the Women's Fund of Western Mass, because we are one of the few organizations <laughs> that connect all four counties together, because I do see a lot of similarities. And it's just interesting hearing people say, oh, I have to drive from Amherst to Springfield. And I'm originally from Michigan, where we do a lot of driving. And I'm like, that's not <laughs> Texas. That Right. Wow, hence the accent. I'm like, that's not that far. And I think people think of it as far because we do exist in these silos in this part of the state. And we are too small and have too many similar disparities to have so many different divides. And Don, um, Don Crichton mentioned um, in our chat, and I just wanted to broadcast it here because it's really important. There's some really great work going on with the digital divide initiative. And I hope that that is the beginning of closing mm -hmm. the silos mm -hmm. that exist in Western Mass. Mm -hmm. So for, yes. I just I, I just wanted to add something quickly to that because um, I grew yes. up in Hamden County and now I live in Hampshire County. And I, I while I appreciate that the distances are are short, there there are cultural different, like there is, there is cultural differences. As a Western Mass native, I am throwing down. We do have differences, but we can work mm -hmm. together. And I think part of part of what happens to us is that um, is, is the way media coverage happens between the counties. Yes. And so it is it, it it does. I don't. I don't hear what happens in Chicopee. I don't hear what happens in Aguam unless I get the Republican because the Gazette only covers so much. And so we we find those divisions created for us in some really artificial ways sometimes. Um, but I also I just want to throw out there too that Hampton County is the more the most diverse of all of the 
counties. And I think that, you know, we have that tofu curtain sometimes, and it, it is because we are dividing ourselves by socioeconomics and by race. Um, and we need to make sure that we're calling that out too. Yes, and thank you so much, Lindsay, for mentioning that. That is also really important to note, just even the cultural difference and the socioeconomic differences amongst the um, <laughs> the counties as well. And that's right, the Berkshires is mentioned a lot in Albany media, given how close it is to the border. So we are now at our time. I wanna thank you all, <laughs> both attendees on Zoom and also Facebook Live for joining us for our very first Wait What? Our next one is going to be sometime probably in February, and we're going to be letting you know what that topic is, because of course, this is the place to support things as they emerge. I want to give a very, 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 very special thank you to our panelists, Tanisha Arana, Trisha Farley Bouvier, Lindsay Sabadosa, and Roxanne Wedegardner. Thank you so much for taking the time to prep, to give such amazing answers, to be so candid and to share your experience with us today. Just a reminder for everyone else that is still here, please make sure to be on the lookout for our newsletter, find us on social media and um, be on the lookout for career conversations. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon and make sure to be nice and great to yourself during the season. Mm -hmm.